<laughs> Cash City Cow Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a review of the new Wu Tang record, A Better Tomorrow. The Wu Tang Clan is an infamous New York hip hop outfit. They have put out classic records over the years 36 Chambers, Wu Tang Forever, numerous solo efforts put out by numerous members of the band. Collectively, Wu Tang has contributed more to hardcore hip hop than a lot of people out there. Now, despite Wu-Tang's immense impact on hip-hop as a genre, there are quite a few duds in the Wu-Tang Clan discography, especially as a group, which, you know, is, is kind of bound to happen due to them having nine members, each of them with their own personal styles, personalities, ambitions, tastes, preferences, and as a group, Wu-Tang over the years has just kind of parted ways for a few years at a time only to reconvene to come out with another group record. And this plan, this way of doing things was working pretty much up until the point of Eight Diagrams, which is a pretty polarizing record in the Wu-Tang discography. Not only was there a very sudden change in instrumental style on this record, but when it comes to lyricism and delivery, it was very clear that Wu-Tang was not really the band of ninjas that they once were, not just because many of them are sort of reaching different peaks in their careers at this point in skill levels individually, but there was definitely something kind of creating a rift in creativity between the group members that kind of kept this album from feeling cohesive. Though still, I do think this album marks an interesting point in Wu-Tang's discography. The extremity and the aggression of the group kind of melts away into the past, back into their heyday, whereas now we're kind of left with this way more adventurous and experimental Wu-Tang Clan. Now since Eight Diagrams, Wu-Tang has kind of followed with a series of records that have been kind of underwhelming, especially Legendary Weapons, where not even every member of the group showed up to appear on this thing. But transitioning from that record to this new album, we seem to have a lot more group participation. And as a result, hopefully a more eventful record too. Of course, I'm not going to be talking about this record by myself. I'm going to be discussing this LP with rap critic Darren Jackson of That Guy with the Glasses. You can find information about him down in the description over there. And I'm going to be changing my shirt as well as soon as I transition. And here we are now with Mr. Darren Jackson coming to talk with me via the internet about this new Wu-Tang record. And being the longtime Wu fan that you are, what did you go into this record expecting? Uh, I would say, you know, I, 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 I got to say I was kind of pessimistic a little bit because, you know, with, with the basically the way the Wu-Tang Clan had kind of been um, – going with concerning, like, joint ventures, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the last five albums from Wu-Tang, you know, have been, like, the Wu-Tang meets the indie culture, you know, like, uh, uh, Eight Diagrams, uh, uh, Wu-Tang versus the Shaolin, and they've always, like, it seems like lately they've been kind of disjointed. They haven't really been clicking as well. I mean, so it was when I came like Legendary album, Weapons I'm record where yeah. not even all of them even showed up. Yeah, yeah, I know. And so, like, when it came to this one, I was like, I don't really know how I'm going to feel about this. Like, you know, they say they got everyone for this one, and they're all in sync, and they're all, you know, doing stuff live now. But I just kind of felt like, I don't know. I feel like I feel like for this album to really work, they have to really be able to click on a level that elevates the um, the overall project. And so I was kind of like, you know, I, I, there's always a bit of optimism, but it just felt like, they had been just on this role of like not really being as fully formed as they sort of used to be. So I was like, I don't really know how this one's going to be. And I, and I was thinking like, in order for them to really like make it pop, they have to really switch it up. It can't just be dusty drums and old samples. Like they have to, they have to really do something big, you know? So, so, so you went into this sort of hoping for like something new. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of the direction they tried to go in with eight diagrams, but, you know, that record can be so polarizing for some people because of how many sort of experiments and new ideas were, you know, Rizzo was trying to uh, employ on that record. Well, um, see, I feel like with eight diagrams, they weren't in sync. 
And like yeah. they were still kind of like, I'm trying to do this really wild out sound over here. And meanwhile, they're just like, well, we're going to do the gritty rap. So, and then they just kind of mashed it together. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think they really, it didn't feel, it didn't come off like they were like, do you guys know what I'm doing? Okay, you know what I'm doing. We're going to put this together. Yeah. You know, it's okay, like, so, so it's I'm, like, you know, you want to hear something new, but they all have to kind of be on the same page too. For exactly. Exactly. And so it felt like the Riz was trying to pull them. And meanwhile, they're like, no, we're, we've got this hardcore sound. We've got to do that, you know? Do you feel like you got something new out of this album? I, I feel like, yes, I did. Uh, I feel like with this album, it was sort of uh, eight diagrams, but with them more in sync now. I feel like that's, that's what I got out of this. I, because, I think that's a pretty fair, fair assessment in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. Because you have the, it goes out there musically. Like, there's a whole sound palette that's not just do 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 gritty drum sort of thing. You know, it has the samples. It has like the, you know, it goes to all these weird places. And then, it, but then it incorporates it with the, uh, with their rhymes. Uh, case in point, the the uh, what was it preacher's daughter? Yeah, uh, th- that was another thing. Just like in general, there there was a lot more storytelling. Um, more precise storytelling going on with their rhymes. And so, like, you know, with Preacher's Daughter, they actually had, like, this lined narrative. Like, it started off with Method Man's verse, you mm-hmm. know, talking about how he met this girl. And then, you know, Master Killer saying, oh, I knew that girl, you know, she's a skeezer. And it's like, so, like, you know, there's the concepts are together. They're strung together. And, and then the music comes with that. It's like they, they rework the... the um, the, the Son of a Preacher Man song. <laughs> the the one downfall for me of that track is that it has the ugliest hook of any song on the album. Like, the singing <laughs> on the chorus is, like, absolutely hideous. The RZA singing. It's just... <laughs> the Son of a Preacher Man. Like, it sounds like it's slightly too far away from the mic. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt like there could have been more ways to recreate the section of music from that song so that it sounded better. You know, but there, there, there was, other there's some other pretty good concept tracks on here as well. Did you like the song um, uh, "Felt"? Uh, that, actually, I I felt like that should have I felt like that should have been like later on in the album. It felt a little too like like okay, we start with "Ruckus" and "B Minor," which yeah. is oh my god, pretty hard hitting track. <laughs> but we're going to it. You know, you hit you get this hard hitting song, and then it just kind of feels like "Felt" kind of like is a little too, you know, I don't know, it felt like slightly too soft for, like, for early, on, for early on in the record, it's kind of a subdued track. Yeah. You know, sure. But, I mean, I but, but lyrically, I mean, I thought they came through with a concept that was like, I don't know, it, it wasn't that strong of a concept. It was kind of like rap about feelings and constantly <laughs> the word um, But... Like it, it was, it was interesting to kind of see the four of them try to take on that challenge. I, I always kind of like am put off when someone when they try to make a song based around having to end every line with a word. Yeah, you know, it was like, you know, you hear songs like that where it's just like we have to lead it eventually to this word. My favorite concept track on here, you know, uh, in terms of like, I think the concept's cool. I think the verses are cool. I think they came through on the instrumental too. Is is maybe necklace? Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Because I think um, uh, for for one, I just love how anti-chorus that song is. It's just like Brother, <laughs> instead I think of a, that is causing you too much trouble. <laughs> I love it's that. like it's such a memorable moment. Like it's so <laughs> it's so absurd, you know. Um, uh, it's, it's so absurd that that would stand out as the hook, and, um, and Raycon comes through with a great verse on on this track too. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, th- there's that track. There's also um, uh, another concept uh, story track, "Mistaken Identity," that yeah. I turned out turned out not too bad. Except for Master Killer, I, I feel like I feel like the people who have gotten better have gotten really better, and the people who have like you know they're all right. They kind of got better, but they haven't like. Uh, they haven't like punched it out of the box, you know. Like, like Capadonna has always felt kind of lyrically sort of weak to me. Like, it feels like, like his flow especially. It feels like he just adds in just three too many words, and it's just like, eh, it just kind of make, makes you go like, you really couldn't have like cut out something or like worded that better, you know? Like with everyone's verses, I can't help but feel like 
okay, can we do that take again? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think, um, um, I, I, I think the most obvious example of that was maybe on um, 40th Street uh, because uh, flow-wise, he's not even really on the in the pocket on that track. There's there's, there's that track, then there's also, um you know, th- then he... Uh, he also dropped this one line on, on the Never Let Go track where just in the midst of, like, a, a series of Never Let Go lines, he just says, uh, Never Let Go of the Soap. You, know, you like, got it. Yeah. Oh, was, was that, yeah, was that him? L- let me check. Uh, I remember it being you got because I was like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, and it's so weird because it starts off with, like, you know, a Martin Luther King quote. Mm-hmm. And then it, it felt like they were trying to do the concept song again, and all they told you, God, was just never let go. That's the name of the song. Just, just <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And he goes in, he's like, eyes on the prize, never let go of the scope. When I'm in jail, never let go of the soap. Hold on, boy, <laughs> never let go. <laughs> there, there, was also, there, there was also another line that he dropped uh, where he was saying, um, uh, he was saying something was, thrilling like the ride called the buccaneer and i was like <laughs> that's kind of forcing it a little bit you know like, like it, it felt yeah that could have been worded differently it's thrilling, yeah, like the ride it that they could have been worded differently and like y- your standard for thrill is a roller coaster you know and it's like you know you usually i expect woo to like push the being as rugged and as raw as they are <laughs> to like push Push the metaphors uh, and the similes a little harder. Well, it's, see that—that's what I mean. Like, you guys has always had kind of had that. Like, he words things weirdly, and it's kind of hard to like put it together. And it feels like you know that's still there. And it feels like you know, twenty years. Like, why yeah. is you know what I'm saying? Like, together they should they should be like boom. This verse needs to be hot. This verse needs to be fully together. And it feels like the shortcomings are still there. Yeah. But you know. The, the songs all around are good, but it feels like individually, like their shortcomings are still kind of around. Like, oh, uh, I feel like we haven't mentioned Inspector Deck yet, though. He's still good. <laughs> yeah, he st- he still had it together, you know. But but you mentioned Jizza earlier, and on this same track, Hold the Heater, where he says that his his verse was kind of unenthusiastic. Really? Oh, you think so? Wait, yeah, hold on. Hold, super hold enthusiastic on on that particular track. I mean, there there were moments where he shined on this record. Um, but for me, that was one track where he just kind of sounded like, I don't know, just, um, uh, it, I, I guess, I guess it was sort of that moment where hip hop is finally coming to that age where you have to come to terms with the greats are now aging, you know, <laughs> and they don't sound the way that they used to, you yeah. know, um, rock's been in that position for a few decades now, you know, mm-hmm. several decades, um, hip hop's just now getting there, and yeah. um, you know, and and this was one of those moments for me, you know, um, and and to me overall, this album is kind of one of those moments for me, even if there are parts that really stand out in it. Yeah, like they, I mean, with the genius, there definitely is an element of like you can hear it in his voice, like this, you know, this isn't 1993, the genius. Yeah. But I, I I still feel like with every song his verses, like, the concepts push far beyond it. Like, I remember listening to, um, um, what's the name of the album with Pencil, uh, and, uh, Firehouse, Pro Tools. Mm-hmm. That was the album where he sounded the most, like, he was just fucking asleep. <laughs> and I feel like, I, so I, I hear the improvement from that, and I'm like, okay, I'm seeing that that's better. Um, I will say, I feel kind of the same way with Raekwon, though. I feel like for some reason he he doesn't like you know Raekwon's always been kind of chill, but if you listen to uh, uh, Only Built for Cuban Links as I just did a couple of hours ago, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know you still hear that sort of fire in his voice, and it kind of feels like he's relaxed, and, but like to his detriment, you know, um, like especially in songs they like that, um, they that one short track, um, Crushed Egos, like in the middle of the LP, it's just like a two minute song. Um, it, it felt like it was only th- that song. I will say, it felt like it was only there for the purpose of showing, look, the RZA and Raekwon are cool again. Yeah, I felt like they were trying to sort of take people back a little bit, you know, by doing by doing that track, you know, um, uh, conceptually. But like, you know, it wasn't a highlight for me. 
Can I can I say uh, a a really good motif that I loved um, was the usage of old Dirty Bastards vocals. Yeah, it, that was actually one thing that at, out of all the th- out of all the things that bugged me about this record, when when they used his voice, it was incorporated in a really natural way. Like yeah. it sounded like it was tasteful and that he was there. You know, um, it, it could have been a lot worse considering that you know I've heard like some awful tracks where he's just constantly sampled again and again and again and like looped in the chorus of songs and just just like (laughs) he goes overboard um when they used him here just like it really made sense and it was it was more than just when eight diagrams just did like here's the old dirty bastard tribute it felt like no he's still here and he's like you know his spirit was still pervading around the the album like the spirit of the album had him in it you know he was ingrained in it instead of just kind of like Here's the one tribute. It's like, no, this isn't just a tribute. This isn't just our. Uh, here's one moment we dedicate to him. Now back to the album. It's like, no, he is still with us. You know, so I, I really like that that feel. There was that verse, and maybe one of my favorite, just sort of single standalone verses on the um on the LP was um when Ghostface appeared right at the end of Miracle Hook or not Miracle, yeah, just the song Miracle. Um, when the production switched up, yeah. it sounded like it sounded like some kind of crazy like Imagine Dragon shit, and then he's like sounding like super duper emotional and passionate and just like in the moment uh, on on that part of the song. Can we talk about that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, um, uh, miracle. Okay, look, I love some of the verses. On this track. I love some of the verses on this track, but I think you're going to talk about the chorus right now. <laughs> If this ain't some Disney sounding shit right here, <laughs> it, it, was like, like, it was like listening to Frozen. <laughs> I thought that someone had popped in a sample from Five Goes West or something. Like I was like, if a miracle, can... I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, it was it was some wacky musical theater shit. And, and the thing I'm is, not... it, like it didn't even fit. <laughs> Like, no, it, 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 that that was one of those moments where I felt like we kind of jumped back to eight diagrams. Where it was like things weren't yeah. syncing up until the end, where you kind of just had that crazy thing where Ghostface Killer and the beat kind of breaks down and that was like some feels weird, insane. That beat was like in it in its in its own way. That was like some weird Kanye shit. Like that's some <laughs> shit Kanye would have done. like. You know, sort of like on the um, Don't Like remix, like, you know, all of a sudden when he comes in, like, the beat changes up, and, like, you know, it sounds like there's this, you know, really epic rising action and everything. Like, it yeah. sounded like that was, you know, very much like a Kanye West move. Um, and, and, and it was executed well, but, like, man, the hook on this track is God. <laughs> but but I, 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 think, I think from that we need to talk about just the production and the hooks in general, because, you know, we've been talking about a lot. The the verses, we like the conceptual tracks for the most part. You know, it, it sounds like theme-wise, everybody's on the same page a lot of the time, you know, which I think gives this album a lot of credit. Um, even if some verses are better than others, even if some performances are more lively than others. But, I mean, as far as the instrumentals go, what was yeah. your take on, on this LP? Um, I thought the instrument, the in, um, instrumentals. I felt that they were definitely. I felt that they were alive. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that mainly came from them using the live bands and like it. It, it pushed the set. Like uh, for example, two of my favorite songs were. Uh, and this is funny because I had heard these songs before. Keep watch. I had heard that before, and I didn't. Maybe it just wasn't finished yet. But I feel like here it popped more, and so I, I, I just dug the. Um, the drive of the song and the chorus and everything, you know, just coming together. Um, I thought that A Better Tomorrow and Wu-Tang Reunion were some of the most beautiful songs on the whole damn album. Like, yeah, Wu-Tang, the Wu-Tang Reunion single has been out a long time, and when this record came out, I wasn't expecting that song to land on it. I mean, maybe there was, maybe maybe they had said publicly that that was going to be the case, and I didn't read it, and I didn't remember, But um, but when that song came out, I was like, Wait, I've heard this. Oh yeah, that's right. That came out like you know, well over a year ago. And when it originally yeah, came out, I liked it. <laughs> yeah, and, and and at the end of the album, it was just the perfect time. 
Like they they David, placed that one perfectly at the David end the there. The he, he comes in with possibly one of my favorite verses. Yeah. Uh, just just the way he described the whole scene, it was just I I felt like I was in that damn moment. You know. There are a lot of I don't know. There there, there are a lot of spots on this record where some weird stuff goes on with the production. Um, you know, like suddenly there'll be this like strange blaring synth lead that just like makes no sense yeah. with anything that's going on. Um, you know, despite the fact that, you know, just a second ago, you might've been hearing just a very kind of clean R and B style chorus. Um, so, so there are elements of the production here where it, it just seems like really odd and unpredictable and experimental. But then again, there are moments where it just seems like, you know, super commercial and clean sort of like on miracle. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's, it's I really, expect to hear that at the day of Grammys next year. I feel like lyrically, everybody is very much on the same page on this record. But I feel like for the weirdest reason, instrumentally, the the record is very much not on the same page with itself. So with Wu Tang, the acronym is Witty, Unpredictable Talent and Natural Game, and I feel like the unpredictable has been kind of missing from their element for a while. You know, like we know if. When the new Wu Tang Clan comes out, it's gonna be at the dusty drum beat. So I feel like he was like, "No, we are unpredictable. Bam, we're gonna hit you with the fucking miracle chorus." <laughs> you yeah. know, like. So I, I felt like I felt like okay, I might not be gravitating towards everything, but I see how they're trying to, you know, swipe the dust off and be like, "No, we are still coming to you with that shit you're not expecting." You know, yeah. so I understand its purpose and I I respect it. I think it's cool in a, in a lot of parts. Miracle, though. <laughs> I came out um, liking quite a bit of this album, honestly. Like, it, it started off kind of rocky for me. Um, really? But I thought maybe the, the last third of the record was, like, incredibly solid. Um, yeah. You know, even though there were some good concept tracks toward the beginning, you know, with songs like Felt, I wasn't really feeling that same level of intensity, you know, that I would usually expect from Wu-Tang. So um, are you saying... Uh, the intensity wasn't helped. <laughs> you know, I thought they came out swinging with Ruckus and B minor, but then, yeah. you know, it just kind of like hit a bit of a lull for me. But then with Wu-Tang Reunion and the Necklace track and, um, you know, uh, much of what else was on the last third of the record, uh, it really started to come together for me. Um, you know, as, as sort of uh, unlikable as some of the parts on this record are, you know, most notably the... Uh, Preacher's Daughter Chorus and the Miracle Chorus. And, uh, you know, and aside from that, I think this record has, like, a lot of interesting things going on um, and a lot of tracks that I like. I don't think it necessarily signals, like, though, however, um, like a bright future for Wu-Tang. I don't think this record necessarily, like, makes me like, super excited for, for whatever they're going to do as a group next. You know, even though I do like tracks on here, I still kind of feel like I hear a group in disarray, and I don't know if you feel that way. I, I feel like I'm really looking forward to the Genius and Method Man's next albums. Uh, mm -hmm. I will say that damn much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I, although I, I do feel like if this was their last album, I would be okay with that. It, it does kind of feel like a swan song in some of the way. In, in yeah, some Eight ways. Diagrams. The last track. Yeah, Eight Diagrams, I was like, oh, please don't let that be their last album. Yeah. You know, their last big album, you know? But this one, I feel like, especially with the way it ends, it feels like the end. They could end it here, and I would be fine. You know, uh, I, I personally, being the super big Wu fan that I am, I still want them to keep going. I want to see the, you know, the Bobby Digital movie, whenever that happens. Like, I want, I want to see shit keep happening with the Wu Tang Clan. But like, if it was like, here's the end of the story, we got to put the book away. I, if we ended here, I would be happy with that. You know. Um, I personally uh, would say out of out of five, I would give it a four out of five. Uh, mm -hmm. if we're rating it um, because I do believe it has those great moments, um, great lyrics. Uh, the it, it has the experimentalism, but with with that experimenting, there's going to be parts where you falter. But I don't think it's to the point where it's like, what the fuck is this? I never want to hear this again. It's like it it, it still has that sort of what was that? Actually, I want to show people this, you know. <laughs> so yeah. It's still good. I personally am feeling like a strong six on this thing. I came out liking it. 
And I think we agree on much of what makes this album good and, um, you know, the, the highlight tracks and, you know, the best tracks. Um, but I think uh, a great deal of the experiments uh, didn't go over well for me, and maybe they were bigger turnoffs for me. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, there, and there were, you know, um, some standout verses for me in terms of just being kind of underwhelming, and some of the vocal mixing from MC to MC was just like... Uh, um, uh, kind of uh, wonky, uh, and like I said earlier, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting record to talk about and pull apart because there's just so many odd things going on. Mm. But I, I think that I think that works to its uh, to its benefit, you know. Instead of just being here's the here's the normal, you know, beat you expect. It's like it gives you those things that make you want to check it out again, you know. And so it's like. I think that was the sort of aim. Like, we need to bring Wu Tang into something new. We can't just be, you know, the same sort of uh, boom, boom, da, do, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, we can't just be that. And I feel like that if that was what their aim was, I think that's good. Um, I think that's what is going to push them forward. Maybe not in the mainstream direction, like, oh, this is going to be a number one hit song, you know. But it's just pushing them forward as in like being making themselves uh, relevant in the sense that we are moving forward, we are doing new things, you know. Like in this is like Kanye, if he was still doing the exact same beats in 2005, I don't think he'd be relevant. You know, it's like he he had to do something, he had to do the 808s and heartbreaks that people might not have agreed with, but it pushed him forward as an artist, you know. So I'd like to see this push them forward forward as artists and maybe you know. Later, we may get this perfect piece, but, you know, this is that moment where they're like, okay, let's step out. With that, I mean, we're going to close this up. Darren, thanks for thanks for coming on and talking this fucking record with me, dude. For sure, man. Um, I'm going to leave a link down there in the description box where you can check out Darren's videos, and, uh, you know, this went really well. I'm sure a lot of you agree, and, you know, I'm sure we'll have uh, Darren on again in the future to talk about some more rap shit. Uh -huh. and, uh, and that's it. So there we go. Anthony Fantano. Darren Jackson, Wu-Tang Clan, A Better Tomorrow, Forever.